This morning we'd like to draw your attention to chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. As Paul is talking here of some of God's glorious blessings, Paul declares, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created together in Christ Jesus unto the good works that God has before ordained that we should walk in them. When Paul declares, by grace are you, are you saved, he is saying, in essence, you don't deserve to be saved. There is nothing of any work that you can do to merit being saved. But though you don't deserve being saved, God has saved you by grace. I don't deserve being saved because as I go back in this chapter, I find in verse 1, I was dead to God as the result of my trespasses and sins. I was a sinner. Now, we really don't like to be told that we're sinners. When Romaine tells us, we sort of laugh, but underneath we chafe. We don't like being called a sinner. And whenever I am accused of being a sinner, I sort of, you know, say, well, I'm not that bad or I'm not too bad. The word sin comes from a Greek word which actually means to miss. To miss the mark. And when I tell you what the mark is, then I think that we'll be ready to confess that we are sinners. The mark that God requires you to hit is perfection. Jesus said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, is there anybody who wants to say they're not a sinner? Wants to stand up and face the congregation and say, Friends, let me tell you, <laughs> I am perfect. I have always been perfect. I have yet to make my first mistake. My wife keeps making her first mistake. At least, at least that's what she says. You know, that's the first mistake I've ever made. But I've heard that song before. We've all sinned. We've all missed the mark. None of us are perfect. Now, the idea of missing the mark, the root behind the word sin it does follow that I can miss the mark even while I'm trying to hit it. Not all that I do is evil and wicked and designingly bad. There are times when I've been trying to hit the mark and I still missed. I'm a poor shot. It is possible that you may be trying to do what is right and still miss. It may be that in your heart you're desiring to do what is good but still miss. So there isn't in the word sin a, a sinister kind of rebellion against God. It's just the declaration that none of us have made it to that point of perfection that God would like to have us live. But there is that other word, transgression. And that is deliberate and that is willful. That is just saying, I won't do it because I don't want to do it and I don't care that you tell me to do it, I still won't. 
where I have transgressed against what God has declared. I knew that I was doing wrong. I did it anyhow. The Word of God told me it was wrong. The Spirit of God within my heart was telling me it was wrong, but I did it. That's a transgression. Now it is interesting that it makes no difference whether it be a sin or transgression. The effect in my own life is still the same. It's alienation from God, spiritual death. And you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins and you didn't deserve to be saved and so by grace are you saved. You didn't deserve to be saved because you were living a life of aimless wandering as you were following after the world. Who in times past you walked according to the course of this world. The word there in Greek is a word that should properly be translated into English. You meandered according to the course of this world. Now there's a difference between walking and meandering. You see a person meandering down the street. You have immediately two impressions of the person. Number one, he's not going anywhere. And number two, he really has no purpose. He's just wandering aimlessly. He's meandering. You see a person walking down the street, you say, well, he's going someplace. There's a purpose. He's going somewhere. To illustrate the difference between walking and meandering, you can watch my wife and I go through a shopping mall. I walk. Before we met Jesus Christ, life was without purpose and we were just wandering aimlessly. And in that condition, we didn't deserve to be saved. And so by grace, God reached out and saved us. As we wandered in this world, we were really being directed by satanic forces. For Satan is behind the fad, the fashion, the flow of the world around you. And if you ever had any question about that, you should not have question anymore as you look at the direction the world is going. Satan is becoming even more obvious. My wife and I were walking into a store the other day and we saw this young boy walking in front of the store, walking past, and he had chains on him. He had a weird outfit on. He had pins stuck in him. And uh, a weird haircut. And I looked and I said, Oh, God, help that poor boy. How sad, how tragic. As they're following the fashions, punk generation. When we were in Copenhagen, there were posters all over the city. Posters of this person that was chained, dressed in black. And the posters read, No Escape. When I, this past week, was looking at a magazine, I saw the pictures of some of the current stars of the music world. These people that the young people are being drawn to the weird makeup, making themselves look grotesque, the weird costuming and all. The heroes and the heroines of the young people today 
They're trying to emulate their lifestyles. And I thought, oh God, it's becoming quite obvious who is running the show, who is behind the world fashions, who's directing the fads and the fashions of the world in which we live. Paul tells us very plainly, you were meandering according to the course of this world which is governed by the prince of the power of the air that even now is working in the children of disobedience. So as you're following the worldly fashions, your life is really being directed by Satan. And in that condition, we really didn't deserve to be saved. But by grace, we were saved through faith. We didn't deserve to be saved because we were spending our lives endeavoring to gratify our own lust. The spiritual side of our nature was dead, and so we were living like animals who live solely to satisfy their body appetites. It is interesting to me that today the natural man, the humanist, teach that man is an animal. And they are opposed to any teaching religious or otherwise, that would in any wise mentally inhibit a man from fulfilling or gratifying all of his fleshly desires. They want nothing to hold you back. No guilt at all in doing anything you may desire to do to satisfy your own fleshly desires. And they look upon any religious system, any field of thought, any philosophy that would in any wise inhibit man from this gratifying of his flesh as, as wrong because man is actually an animal and thus you might as well live as the animals uninhibited. And so the natural man does live today. And because he is taught that he is an animal, he looks to the animal kingdom to find his roots. And he sees the baboon and says, yes, I act like him and I sort of look like him. I've probably descended from him. But the Bible says that you did not ascend from the animals, you descended from God. That man is the offspring of God. And you'll never find your roots in the animal kingdom but your roots are in God. And you'll never be fulfilled or satisfied trying to relate to the animal kingdom. You can never be fulfilled until you relate to God. That's why the teaching of evolution is so degrading. It's not the teaching, the religion of evolution because it takes tremendous faith to believe in that more faith than it does to believe in creationism. It's a religion. People are devoted to it. It takes blind faith to accept it. But the religion of evolution is extremely degrading to man because it will bring man down to the animal level. Whereas Christianity is elevating to man because it lifts man to the divine 
level. But as I lived to satisfy my own flesh, the desires of my flesh and of my mind, I was alienated from God and I didn't deserve to be saved. And so by grace, I was saved. You didn't deserve to be saved because by nature you were a child of wrath. One day Jesus said to the Jews that were not believing and disputing with him, you are of your father the devil and his works you do. By nature we were the children of wrath. As such, we deserve the wrath of God, not salvation. And so it is by grace that you have been saved. In spite of what I was, God, who is rich in his mercy, in the psalm we read this morning, the psalmist said, As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high is your mercy towards those that fear you. As our scientific capabilities are expanding and as we are probing the universe with new types of uh, devices, we are discovering how large this universe actually is. Years ago when I was in high school, and in my science classes, and in college, and in my science classes, because the largest optical device we had at that time to study the universe was the telescope at Mount Palomar. With that telescope, they ascertained that the universe was some four billion light years in radius because they were discovering galaxies some four billion light years away. Now with the development of newer types of equipment to probe the universe, they have discovered galaxies that they say are some 12 billion light years away from the earth. And so our universe now they believe to be some 12 billion light years in radius. Now that really doesn't disturb me that they've expanded the universe from 4 billion light years to 12 billion light years. All it has done is expanded God's mercy towards me and I can use it all. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high is His mercy. I really deserve the wrath of God for what I was. But God is rich in his mercy wherewith he loved me. God loved me when I was in my rebellious state. God loved me when I was wandering aimlessly. Here in his love, not that we love God, that's no big deal, but that God loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. For God demonstrated his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. No, I don't deserve to be saved, but by grace I have been saved And God brought my spirit back to life. And you hath he made alive. My spirit has been born again. I have now come into a spiritual dimension of life. Whereas I once lived a life after the flesh, I now live a life after the spirit where once my chief purpose was the satisfying of my own fleshly desires, now my chief purpose is to please God and His desires for my life. A changed life. 
Life in a new dimension, life on the spiritual plane. By grace are you saved and not of works. <laughs> there is no work that you can do to save yourself. There is no work that you can do to change your nature. When I was a kid, I used to hear Popeye say, I'm Popeye the sailor man. I am what I am, and that's all that I am. I'm Popeye the sailor man. Well, yes, that's true of the natural man. I am what I am, and you can add, there's nothing I can do to make myself any different. I'm me. I can't change what I am. How often we find ourselves trying to change what we are. I see what I am, I don't like it. I say, I'm not going to be that way. But I am what I am. And so there is no work that I can do to change me from what I am. The Bible says, can a leopard change his spots? He can't. No, that he's spotted by nature. I'm spotted by nature. There's no work that I can do to change me. It takes a work of God. I can't do it myself. And all of my efforts to clean up my act, to put on beautiful robes that God might accept me in my works of righteousness are futile because God looks at all of my righteous works as filthy rags. Now the reason why God has disallowed the works of man as a basis for his salvation is that God desired to eliminate boasting. He knows that there is something within the natural man that desires to boast, desires to glory, and is seeking glory for himself. And so God eliminated man's efforts and works as the basis for his salvation so that man could not glory or boast in what he had done. All I can boast or glory in is the mercy and the love of God that reached down to even me. And I glory in the work that Jesus Christ did for me on the cross when he paid the debt that I could not pay. So Paul says you are his workmanship. You see, it really isn't my work for God that counts, but it's God's work in me that counts. The word workmanship here in the Greek is a word poema. We get an English word directly from that Greek word. It's our English word poem. What, the, what Paul was saying here is you are God's poem. Now a poem is more than just a work. It is a work of art. And within poetry, there's a certain grace and a certain beauty. And the effect of God's work in my life is, is that of grace and beauty. For the artist is always endeavoring to express himself in his work. No different with God. As God is working in you, as you are his poem, God is seeking to express himself in your life. Paul tells us that all of this is that we might one day fulfill those good works that God has already planned that we should accomplish for the glory of Jesus Christ. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for those good works that God has already ordained that you should accomplish. Now it is interesting 
for me to realize that God looking down the road knows exactly what his plan is for my life and for my future. God already has mapped out the work that he wants me to do for his kingdom. God knew from the beginning exactly the work that he had in mind for me to accomplish for his glory. So through the years, God has been working in me to prepare me for that work that God wanted to do through me. And at this stage of my life, I can look back now and I can see a lot of those difficult experiences that I went through. Experiences that at the moment that I was going through them. I was looking upon them as a curse. I was praying that God would free me from them. But as I look back now, I see that they were God's hand working in my life, getting rid of the rough edges and preparing me for that which he was wanting to use me for in time to come. Those experiences that I was counting as real trials, heavy burdens, were all a part of God's working in me for he was preparing me for a work that he knew that he wanted me to fulfill for the kingdom's sake. And all of that was necessary preparation. That is why it is so foolish for us to, or men today, I surely don't teach it, men to teach that you're in control of your own destiny you can command God to do whatever you desire. And if you do so by faith, you make your claim, God's got to honor it and God's got to do it. And suddenly you become God and he becomes your genie. Not so. And I would not have it so if I could. Because I would mess up my life so badly. I would have messed up my life so badly in the past as I did not know what God was doing. I did not know what God had in mind during those days of suffering and trial and hardship. God knew what he was doing. They seemed to me a trial. God was using them. He was working in me to prepare me for the work that he wanted me to accomplish. Now I do believe that it is possible for us to remove us ourselves from that place where God is working in our lives. I can rebel against that work of God in my life and by so doing I can take myself away and never accomplish that which God had purposed that I should accomplish for the kingdom. I think that I can bail out when God is working and say, Lord, I'm not going to have any more of this. And if I bail out at that point, I'll never discover what God had in mind for my life in His will to accomplish for the kingdom's sake. God's work in me is important if I'm ever to do the work that God has before ordained that I should accomplish for His glory. Now, I don't always know the work that God has in mind. And my timing doesn't always coincide with His. I thought I was ready to do the work of God when I was in seminary. I thought that as I was sitting there in classroom, it was the biggest waste of time ever. There's, there's a world out there that needs to be saved. They're lost and they're waiting for me. And here I am, closed up in this seminary, wasting my time in these studies. God, the world needs me. It's waiting for me. I've got the message. 
And when the day of graduation came and I was finally revealed, no one was aware of it. <laughs> no one seemed to care. No one came. And God then began the long process of working in me through the years, through the trials, through the failures, through the many efforts that I put forth on my own behalf, through my many works that ended up in total disaster or failure, God was working in me until he finally got me to the place where he wanted me. And I said, God, I'm through. I'm going to leave the ministry. I'm a failure. And then God began to do that work that he had already planned to do way back in the beginning of time. The will of God began to be unfolded in my life. And I began with amazement to see the work that God had before ordained that I should accomplish for the glory of his kingdom. And as I stood watching God work, I became amazed and overawed and humbled by what God was doing. But God had to bring me to that place of personal failure so that when he did do his work, I wouldn't be out taking bows and, and, and trying to take credit and tell everybody how marvelous I really am and how I knew it all the time. The work of God in me was essential in order that God might work through me. Now, I don't mean to intimate that God's work in me is complete, not by a long shot. God is still working in me today. I don't know what God has in store for me tomorrow, you see. And that's what makes living this Christian life so exciting. You don't know from one day to the next just what God has in mind and the plan of God for you to do for the glory of his kingdom and what tomorrow may hold, what new opportunities may be there, what new doors God may open for ministry or the expansion of the work of God as he has already, he knows, he knows exactly what's in mind, but he is working in us day by day, and it's important that we yield ourselves to that work of God within our lives. It's important that we submit ourselves to that work. And if we are suffering according to the will of God, to commit the keeping of our souls unto God as a faithful creator, he knows what he's doing, though I may not. He knows what he is preparing me for, though I don't. But at this stage, seeing the work that God has done through my life, looking back at that necessary work of God in my life to bring me to the place where God could work through me, as I look back to those trials and to those pains and those sufferings, I wouldn't trade any of them for a moment for the glory of being an instrument through which God has been able to do His work. And I've come to a much deeper, fuller, richer understanding of those past experiences as God has now translated them into the present work through my life today. And so I look back with thanksgiving upon what was once to me a great trial, a great burden. Maybe today you're going through a heavy trial. Maybe today you're experiencing just the sense of, of frustration and, and, and uselessness. Oh, how long I felt that. That was necessary. God was working in me. There were a lot of things God had to work out of me in order that he might work through me. God is wanting to work through your life. He has already ordained a plan for you 
the work that he wants you to accomplish for his glory. And so don't despise these days of preparation. Let God have his perfect work in you that you might be able to accomplish his complete plan through you. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you today that you have saved us not by our efforts but by thy grace. And that you're working in our lives through thy grace, through thy love. And those things that are hard for us are important to our development as you seek to prepare your instrument that we might do your work. That we might realize that it is your work when it is done. Lord, sometimes it comes so easy and we begin to think that we've got the formula, that we have the wisdom that we have the capacities. And then, Lord, it's necessary for you to suddenly take it away in order that we might recognize that we don't have anything but you. And we need your help. And we need your guidance. Lord, work in us. Prepare us, Lord, and we pray that you will work through us for your glory. And we will be careful, Father, not to take the glory or to think anything of ourselves because you worked through us. For we recognize it is by grace, it is your work, and it's to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. May he continue to work in you, and may he work through you for his glory. That work and that plan that he had in his mind from the beginning, when he first began to work in you. May the Lord be with you and bless. Fill your life with his joy and with his love and with the sense of his presence. In Jesus' name.